Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Board Fellowship Forum. My name is Haley Phillips. I am the Program Director at Business Plus Impact at Michigan Ross. In this role, I manage the Nonprofit Board Fellowship Program. Each year, this program places highly qualified graduate students from across the University of Michigan as non-voting members uh, on nonprofit boards throughout Southeast Michigan. The fellows work on a strategic project with board and staff mentors over a period of seven months. Each year, this fellowship program also hosts a public forum in the form of a panel discussion with leaders from local nonprofit organizations. This year, the theme of the forum is pivoting during a pandemic, how nonprofit organizations have innovated and adapted during a time of crisis. We have seen the COVID-19 pandemic create new realities and challenges while deepening and exposing existing inequalities. Within the nonprofit sector, these impacts have been felt profoundly in the communities and the organizations that serve them. Organizations are navigating evolving crises, weighing trade-offs, and also pivoting and creating novel solutions and innovative adaptations. Particularly in light of all they are holding, we thank our panelists for sharing their time and their wisdom with us this evening. And to all of our attendees, we appreciate each of you joining us, the dis uh, joining us in this discussion to learn and dialogue with each other. Tonight's panel will be moderated by our senior fellows. These students have been selected to hold this leadership role after successful completion of the board fellowship program and serve as a pivotal resource for our current fellows. Our first senior fellow is Jatim Lyons. She is a second year dual degree student getting an MBA and a master's in public policy. And she is pursuing a career in social impact consulting. She has experience as a board fellow with the United Way of Washtenaw County. Our second senior fellow and moderator this evening is Emily Edkins. Emily is an MBA student pursuing a career in healthcare management. She was a board fellow last year with North Star Reach and sits on two local nonprofit associate boards in Chicago. Again, welcome everyone, and I will pass it over to Shatim and Emily to introduce our panelists. I'll begin this evening by first introducing Pam Smith, who I had the pleasure of working with last year during my board fellowship. Pam Smith has been the president and CEO of the United Way of Washington County since 2012. As a nonprofit executive, she is dedicated to strengthening the community through philanthropy, collaboration, and community engagement. Her vision and leadership guides the equity, diversity, and justice work of the United Way of Washington County. She has more than 25 years of experience in management, communications, and nonprofit administration. She has served on local nonprofits boards as a UM guest lecturer and on local advisory teams. Ms. Smith has extensive experience in marketing, training, and workforce development. Her development and fundraising skills have made her keenly aware of the intricate balance of the diverse needs within the Southeast Michigan community. Next up, we have Daryl L. Johnson, who is the Executive Director and Mentor to Youth. He only served as a board member for three years prior to becoming ED, so he's definitely going to have a diverse perspective. He sits on the steering committee of Washington My Brother's Keeper, a countywide transformation and youth empowerment collaborative, and also sits on the board of Summer Camp Scholarships, a local nonprofit that sends over 100 kids to camp each year. In addition to business and psychology coursework completed in the San Diego City College and nonprofit administration coursework completed at Walkers College in Kansas City, Missouri, Daryl Johnson has been selected to participate in local leadership initiatives, including Zine Train, New Delhi Leadership Training, and News Leaders of Color Workshop, and attends workshops and conferences to stay abreast of ever-changing business landscape. He is a trained facilitator for Search Institute's Keep Connected, Family Strengthening Program is also trained to the Gamaliel Foundation and Community Organizer. He is a servant leader. Next, I'll hand it off to Emily. Thanks, Jatem. And I have the pleasure of introducing Tim Carter. Tim is an associate for McKinsey and Company based out of the Detroit office with a primary focus on service operations across a variety of industries, including the social sector. Over the past year, he has also provided support and guidance for small businesses in navigating through the pandemic. He is a graduate of Hope College in Holland, Michigan, 
in addition to holding a Master in Science in Environmental Engineering from Wayne State University and a Master of Business Administration from the University of Michigan Ross School of Business. He currently serves as the Chair of Strategic Planning on the Board of Directors for 10,000 Villages Fair Trade Retail Store in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He was first introduced to 10,000 Villages while serving as a Senior Fellow himself during his time at Ross. He also has nearly a decade of experience in nonprofit leadership positions, including serving as the County Director for a Humanitarian Relief Organization in South Sudan. In addition, his passion for social impact has led him to help launch a startup aimed at producing ventilators for under-resourced communities across the globe. We thank Tim, Daryl, and Pam for joining us this evening. And to start off the evening, I am going to start with asking each of the panelists if you could introduce yourself to the group, um, tell a little bit about the nonprofit you represent, and the type of work that you do with the organization. And let's start with Daryl, and then we'll go to Pam and then Tim. All right, good evening, everybody. I'm Daryl Johnson, and the Executive Director of Mentor to Youth. And um, we like to say we're bridging the opportunity gap with youth empowerment, family involvement, and community collaboration. Uh, I think it's important that in our work, we really learn how to bring in uh, a more holistic approach. We kind of started off as, you know, mainly around tutoring and Uh, helping kids with their academics, but especially a time like this really kind of shows for uh, the mental, social, emotional health, the business and financial literacy. Oftentimes uh, in our community, people just don't have that expertise. So that's what we focus in and uh, happy to be on board tonight. Oh, me next. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, first, I want to say I want to start by saying thanks to Jatam Lyons, who was a rock star on our board. Um, it's so important to have a student leader, um, to have a dynamic voice, and for, for people to be able to share their expertise to inform our decisions. So thank you very much, Jatam, for joining us. Um, my name is Pam Smith. I serve as the CEO of the United Way of Washtenaw County. We're an anti-racist, anti-poverty organization that provides a safety net of support for the entire community, both people and nonprofit agencies. Awesome. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tim Carter. I currently serve as the chair of strategic planning for the Ann Arbor store of 10,000 Villages. <laughs> 10,000 Villages has stores across the U.S. and Canada. Um, we are a fair trade retail outlet, so we provide living wages for artisans across the globe in disadvantaged communities, and we sell their products here in the United States um, <clears throat> in order to promote fair trade um, and give them a living income. I started, initially got connected to the board during my time as a board fellow at Ross. And it's really an incredible intersection of my passion for business and my background in the nonprofit sector in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so really an incredible organization that I'm excited to be a part of. And yeah, happy to be here with all of you tonight. Great. Thank you all. I'm going to pass it over to Jatem for our next uh, question for the group. Thank you, Emily. Uh, we're going to pivot now and focus on innovation and adaptation due to the pandemic. For these questions, we will specify who would we like to start. That does not mean um, no one else can chime in. And we do ask if at least two panelists can chime in per question just to hear a diversity of thought. Um, so the first question, we'll start with Pam. How has the pandemic impacted the communities you engage with through your work? How have existing inequities been amplified or transformed? Well, I could talk for about two hours on that first question, so thank you, <laughs> but I won't, don't worry. Um, I think that um, for the United Way, we, we focus on poverty and inequity and racism that exists in Washtenaw County. And so through our work, we knew already that marginalized communities and communities of color were going to be greatly affected by the COVID pandemic. And 
while we didn't want that to be true, it became very apparent very quickly and very clear that that's exactly what was going to happen. And although um, the black population in Washtenaw County is only 12%, 40, 48%, I'm sorry, 48% um, of, the, of their population was being dramatically affected by COVID. So United Way started a COVID relief fund. Uh, we raised over a million dollars in under four weeks. But more importantly, we returned 100% of those dollars back out into community uh, in the very next four weeks. So it showed us that we could become a much more nimble and flexible organization than we had been in the past, where typically grant cycles lasted two to three years. Um, and so throughout the pandemic, we, we, um, we talked on a variety of different levels. We, we did a COVID edition of the 21 day equity challenge in five days, just to bring about conversation and spotlight the social determinants of health and what was actually happening in our community. Um, so those are some of the ways that we changed what we did, how we pivoted and how the community was impacted by COVID. And I guess, I guess I'll jump in with, you know, just for us, I think the biggest piece was uh, the technology divide. Uh, as we look to serve our constituents, it, it was just clear that uh, a lot of it was just overwhelmed uh, from technological standpoint and also just from the fatigue of it. And so really trying to help our community work their way through, uh, maintain that education, help parents uh, just keep their kids in school has really been our big fight. Our programming was really, you know, we looked and saw how our program really was fit the virtual platform, but our constituents were so fatigued, it really didn't matter, right? They just couldn't do one more Zoom, right? So uh, really thankful for uh, Pam Smith and United Way. We were recipients of some of that money and that's what kind of, that's what helped us stay afloat and uh, be active in the community, so. For 10,000 villages, oh, for 10, villages, the communities we support are already disadvantaged communities across the globe. We source a lot of products from Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Latin America. A lot of our artisans also um, live and work in the slums. So they've been raised in the slums, they've stayed there and operate their businesses so they can offer job opportunities to others with a similar background. And so these are communities where, um, you know, they're not looking, how can I get to my next paycheck? These people are looking, how can I survive the day, right? How can I make enough money for myself and my family? And then on top of that, you have the pandemic, you know, these slum areas like social distancing masks, this is not a thing, right? I mean, it's just not possible to keep six feet dis distance. They don't have access to the testing, to the resources. And so now on top of, how can I try to support my family? It's also the question of, you know, how can I survive um, the next day through this pandemic? And so they've been, you know, already marginalized communities has been significantly exacerbated over the past year. The only other thing I wanted to add just to, um, um, say a little bit more about what Daryl shared to give the board fellows a real feel for what was happening in community. So, you know, when Daryl came back and, and, and told us about, you know, our kids need laptops, our kids need iPads. And then we found out that everybody needed an internet connection. And then we went to Comcast and engineered a deal where they were going to get free internet access or low cost internet access. But then we found out that if they had an outstanding balance with Comcast, they weren't eligible for the program. So like it was every time we overcame one barrier, there was another barrier in the way. And, you know, Daryl and his team did such an incredible job to keep families and children engaged because, I mean, I know you guys are all feeling it, right? Like you'd rather be in a classroom than Zooming everything. But just think if you're five or six or seven years old and you're being told you have to sit and Zoom all day, you know, it's just, it's really hard. Um, so my hat's off to Daryl and his team. Thank you, Pam. 
Thank you all. Those were really, yeah, really interesting insights. And, um, you know, not only were the communities impacted that you serve, but your own internal organizations were impacted and the people in your organizations trying to put their whole heart and soul into um, jumping into the opportunity to help these communities um, probably in a different capacity than they ever had. So our next question is around um, talking about how the pandemic has impacted your own organization, um, your board, and just the staff members. Um, what, what are some things that you've seen um, and you know, what are also maybe some glimmers of hope and, and creativity that you've maybe seen in your boards as well? Um, and with this question, we're gonna start with Tim. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the pandemic has been incredibly challenging for us because we rely on retail sales um, to support the artisans. That's our entire business model, right? We have very limited fundraising opportunities. Um, it's just through the sale of our products. And as you know, you know you've seen JCPenney, J. Crew, all these massive retailers going bankrupt, right? We're on a much smaller scale and located in downtown Ann Arbor, you know, with the restaurants closed for a good portion of the last year. There's no traffic, people aren't coming downtown, right? And so our 2020 sales are 50% of what they were in 2019. And when most of your costs are all fixed costs, right? We have to pay rent, we have to pay staff. Um, it poses a significant challenge when your revenue has been cut by 50%. And so for us though, we, you know, we wanted to still keep supporting our employees. So we, we maintained everyone on the payroll. We were a bit fortunate um, to be in a solid financial position um, pre-pandemic, I know a lot of all other small businesses and nonprofits um, were not in that situation, right? The average cash on hand for a small business in the U.S. is 27 days. That's less than a month. Um, fortunately, we, we were in a good position, so we're able to maintain our employees and support them during this incredibly difficult time. Um, but it's, it's a continued challenge, right? That's even last month, our sales were just over 50%. And so, you know, a lot of conversations, which we'll probably get into, moving forward here tonight, but just how do we uh, pivot and adapt moving forward? Tim, did um, 10,000 villages qualify for the small business loan or the PPP protection loan? Uh, we did. So we did apply for the Paycheck Protection Program from the federal government, both round one and the more recent round two, and were approved. So that did help bridge the gap. I mean, it doesn't make up for the past 12 months, but it certainly helped a lot. I know for a lot of nonprofits in the community, that was a bridge for people that, that really did help them kind of pull through. So I, we were able to apply for the first one, um, which prevented any layoffs for us. We're, we're a really small organization. There's only 12, 12 FTEs here. Um, we like to say we're little, but we work big. Um, <laughs> um, but that, that was able to stem any layoffs until summer for us. Um, so internally, um, everything was turned upside down. We were, um, we are used to being in community, whether we're holding community conversations in co-creating solutions or being in uh, businesses doing campaign work and fundraising for the community. So that all had to stop. Um, we do a program called VITA, which is free income tax assistance preparation. We typically do a thousand returns. We bring about $2 million back to the community. So it's an important socioeconomic driver because those dollars that are coming back are resources, cash in hand for our clients that need it most and it's reinvested in community. But that, we couldn't see a thousand people. So we had to develop like a whole new system of moving tax preparation online for a clientele that didn't necessarily have the internet or didn't have the, the, the scanners and the printers that they needed. Uh, so that we got much better this year, but that hit, COVID hit right during the, the height of tax season for us. So that was pretty crazy. Um, we did have to end up laying off one person um, to, to move the mission of the organization forward. We are grateful that we were able to offer that person a position back again. Um, and then the board took on, because uh, a nonprofit board is fiduciarily responsible for an organization, we had to have a lot of really hard talks with them about, like Tim mentioned already, cash flow, um, our cash reserves, uh, cash became king, so we knew exactly what was coming in and going out at any given time. We had multiple grants that we had to pay out on, um, so we had to really um, amp up 
how carefully we watched um, cash flow uh, to the tune of every other week instead of uh, once a month with our finance committee. So those are just some of the ways it changed us. Yeah, we're a much smaller organization and I'll tell you the impact, you know, I just took over in November and then this happened for us in March. And so we laid off our staff and really leaned on our board, right? And our board really took up positions. Uh, I was in the leader of colors. We had four new board members come on and we had to ask our board to do the work. I, I stayed on, uh, I started off as the volunteer executive director and I stayed as a volunteer this whole time. And so what we did is we just partnered with other organizations and agencies to uh, provide the support that we could and then kept building our organization to be ready for what comes on the other side of the pandemic. When we talk about uh, kids being behind and how will we support them and how will we build that out? What does that uh, social, emotional, and mental health looks look like. What do parents need? That was our. That was the two groups that we kept running was our uh, youth council and our parent village, parent to village. And so, trying to uh, assist and support parents in that space kind of became became a new uh, line of work for us. And so, uh, you got to be ready to pivot and go where the you know where the work is needed. Thank you all so much. And you kind of touched on um, some points with our next question. Um, and so I would just provide um, you all more opportunity if you wanted to expand on how your organization, like what challenges or possibly opportunities that were presented uh, on a positive side, but also if you wanted to dig in deeper to um, what were the challenges and opportunities for your funding and operational models. And so we'll start with Daryl, Pam, then Tim. Yeah, I, you know, I like to say we were so, uh, you know, we were, our budget is always so tight anyway. And as we were building out and trying to reach like the pandemic hit and that last big fundraiser for us, which would have, you know, supposedly bought in probably about 50,000 was just gone. So there we were really struggling. And what that really kind of taught, uh, we looked at during this time is how do we rethink our model? Right, and how do we deliver uh, to kids who may be behind, and what does that look like? And to be honest, we're thinking that this virtual model is really a great opportunity. Now, right now, it's not a great opportunity because there's so much fatigue. But when the kids go back to school, the fact that a child can have a tutor one-on-one -on -one is probably going to be, especially if you're. Uh, if you're remedial, right? So having that kind of work will be, uh, help that child get back up to level in reading and math. So we're super excited about that. And that involves the community, you know, whether it's a U of M, Eastern, uh, Concordia, the churches, the, the rec centers. Now through a virtual format, everybody can volunteer. Right, And if we get kids reading 30 minutes a day with our leveled reading program, all of a sudden we feel like we can really turn that around. And I think what's funny about that is that's the same reading program we had before, but we thought we were delivering, delivering it in a way that the kids had to come to us, right? And so now they don't have to come to us, which means we can really serve more kids. Um, I'll stop there because I'll keep going. So. Um, I feel you, Daryl. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the great opportunities for us is because of the work that we were doing for, with social justice and racial equity in our community, we had developed new partnerships and new collaborations. And so what that allowed us to do was go much deeper in community and look at things in a whole new way. So typically as a funder, we would only be funding 501c3s, so recognized nonprofit agencies, but because our connections were running so deep in communities that were so in need, um, we started getting really creative. Um, and so what that means is we were funding neighborhood groups, community groups, community centers, um, 
church programs. And what we were doing was like trying to jump over every obstacle um, as we came to it. And so um, we would find fiduciary agents for them. We would say, what else do you need? And so consequently through the COVID relief fund, we worked with um, out of 60 people or 60 organizations that we funded, 19 of them were new to us, brand new. Like we've been funding nonprofits for a, a hundred years in our community, but this gave us an opportunity to go much deeper than we ever had before and to take a lot more chance, a lot more risk with our investments. And um, for those of you that are, I don't know, statistically inclined, um, the risk, we only actually had one organization, one of our new partners that returned any dollars to us, um, not being able to spend them all out. So that was a great return on our investment. Um, programs were met with fidelity. They were delivered with fidelity and, and efficacy. Um, and so that was a that was a huge win for our, our community, I think, because of the new partnerships and collaborations and different nonprofits that were now working with each other uh, like they never had before. Yeah, 10,000 Villages, as I mentioned, our biggest challenge was really um, financing, given that you know, our revenue is 50% of what it was the year before. So I'll talk a little bit about how we've had to adapt our funding and operational model um, because of this. One, as I mentioned, was the Paycheck Protection Program to approve for it was a critical stopgap for us. We were also a bit fortunate that the year, I guess the months before pandemic hit, we realized the need to start fundraising. Traditionally, it had not been part of our business model. We just rely on sales. Um, but with a decrease in store traffic over the years, um, we had actually started, you know, brought on a development chair for the board to spear some fundraising efforts. So the past two years, we have raised some funds. It's a very small percentage um, of our revenue, you know, which is for the artisans, but at least has helped bridge the gap um, a little bit for us. And then I think what we're really concerned right now, we've been fortunate to have Annie Zaro. I see Annie is um, on video here as the board fellow this year. She has been um, essential in helping us think through contingency plans. So pre-pandemic, you know, as the chair of strategic planning, I was really focused on three years, you know, how do we increase sales and marketing? You know, business is pretty good, but how can we sell more to help more artisans overseas? Pandemic hits and now it's like, how do we survive, right? And if like 10,000 villages headquarters goes bankrupt, what are we gonna do? So Andy has done a tremendous job for us putting together, thinking through a contingency plan, you know, should headquarters um, go under, how do we survive um, on our own as a standalone store? And a lot of what you put together, we're looking at trying to implement now, you know, we have some contractual rules, for example, for like e-commerce that make a few things difficult for us, but we're trying to, to take some of the great work she did and start to implement um, and modify our, our business model here in the coming months. Definitely all very interconnected issues. And I know you all touched upon a little bit some of the pivots your organizations have made. And we wanted to go a little bit deeper into this idea of pivoting um, during a crisis. And if you could share what you think your most successful pivot has been, um, what some of those characteristics were, the impact, and also if you could do that differently or expand upon that pivot, what do you see kind of as the future of the organization? Um, and we're gonna start with Tim. Yeah, I guess the last question is a good segue into this. Um, so on our side, being a retail store, it's, it's probably what you would imagine, right? It's like curbside delivery, it's enhancing digital experience, um, enabling e-commerce are the things to look at to pivot our business model. Now the, the contact with curbside delivery, we did start at the beginning of the pandemic. It's probably been our most successful pivot to date. We did not offer that previously. Um, I would say sales have been through the roof, but at least it's been something more than we would have gotten otherwise. Um, we also, unfortunately, e-commerce is really a critical piece for us, but the, our website is managed by kind of the corporate 10,000 villages and our contract with them prevents us from like operating our own website. So that's a huge setback for us. Um, we get a small percentage of sales if the zip code that someone ordered from is the local zip code. Um, but so basically we get very little online. And so and based on some of the work Annie did, we're trying to explore 
opportunities with corporate to, to operate our own website or at least be able to, um, at least if people order online and pick up in store. So we're looking at a few other options um, in the future. We also, one other thing we tried, but this was not successful, um, was actually hosting like virtual shopping experiences. So a lot of retail stores now are trying to pivot and, you know, before it was all about the in-store experience. Well, now capacity is limited in most cases by government regulations. So it's how can you create this experience digitally? Um, that one hasn't panned out too much for us to date, but um, something we're still pursuing. Um, I think for us, I think, you know, 2020 has been a year of racial, kind of racial reckoning almost. And for us, putting equity first with every grant decision that we made was really important. So much so that 75% of all of the dollars that we raised went to the highest need areas, which is 48197 and 48198 in Washtenaw County. So um, many of you may know that as the Ypsilanti area. 73% um, of those dollars explicitly served BIPOC communities. And then what was a real change for us and a really important change is that 52% of the grants that we made went to agencies led by people of color. And the reason that is so important is because leaders that are working in their neighborhoods know the solutions that they need. They don't need a funder saying, you should do this. So recognizing and taking a step back and putting the dollars, not only where they'll do the most good in an unrestricted operating uh, um, position, as opposed to a program grant. So a program grant is I'm giving you X amount of dollars to do a very specific thing. And unrestricted operating dollars are saying, you guys take this money, you do whatever you need to do with it to deliver on your mission in your community. So very different for us. Um, and the win out of all of that was not only stronger partnerships and better solutions, but we attracted the attention of the um, MPHI Racial Diversity Task Force at a state level who sent $500,000 more dollars into our community because of the work and because of the outcomes we had gotten with our intentionality. So that was a win for us and a win for Washtenaw County. <laughs> And I'd like to add that for us, you know, what, 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 what really pivoted for us is really understanding what collaboration looks like. I mean, for me being new, I think my first real kind of like taste was catch a fire. And so I started posting projects and, and people would do certain work for us. And it was like, oh, wow, if, 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 if you could come in and really what it was like is like they were mentoring me. Right. And so then we put up this notion, well, what if that catch a fire could work with a high school student who would learn different aspects of business? And then we collaborated with Michigan Works and got the high school student paid. Right. So now he has an intern. They have a different motivation for going to school. All of our kids are doing well in school. Right. So we were super excited to really understand how collaborations work. I apologize, I'm not from here. You can see my Kansas City stuff. I didn't really understand like what the Michigan difference was, right? So after working with a catch a fire, then I got in with Ginsburg and they started showing us how to collaborate with, with, with University of Michigan students. And it's like, you gotta be kidding me, right? We were out here sometimes spending more money by trying to hire staff when really we can meet a lot of those needs through volunteers and interns that really allows us to deliver impact in a whole different way. So we're super excited about this time because it allowed us to step back. You know, sometimes you're so busy uh, 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 doing the, the bottom line that you don't really have a chance to step back and see what the good pivot is. And that's what uh, COVID, that's been the blessing of uh, the pandemic for us. It really allowed us to step back and go in a different direction. Yeah, I love that. All, all of what you guys said, you know, about racial equity, about the community, what is collaboration is kind of these things have been there all along, but 
it sometimes takes a crisis or some event in some very strange way to just actually wake people up in a different way. Um, and it's, it's great to see that some, some good, however small, there's more to come, but that it's starting and that this is in some way um, helping catalyze. And uh, I'm gonna turn it to Jatem. Actually, we're gonna go deeper into some of the, the funding questions and saw a great resource that Jatem and Pam just pinged into the chat as well. Thank you, Emily. Um, and Pam, you brought up such a great point around the fact that normally nonprofits um, struggle with their operating costs because they receive restricted funding. Um, and so this question is for the panel, but Pam, I would love for you to start. How have funders pivoted to meet community needs and develop new models of collaborations in the midst of COVID? Um, thanks for that question, Jatem. So um, a lot of it um, I covered in my last answer as far as how United Way has shifted, but also what we're seeing across philanthropy as a sector. So the entire sector, which would include private foundations, family foundations, public foundations, um, uh, you, uh, funders like United Ways um, across the country, we are having, we have a much deeper understanding of how we need to actually kind of um, break down and, and change um, the actual structure of philanthropy because it's rooted in a white patriarchy and a hierarchy that says, I have the money, I'm going to keep the money and I have power in keeping that money. So how do we dismantle that, the very structure and the basis of philanthropy and make sure that these dollars are going out to community? So for United Way, um, we put about 85 to 90% of what we raise back out into the community every year. So we would be considered like a checking account, right? A foundation, is like a savings account for the community. So they build wealth, they keep what that comes into them and they put 5% back out into the community based on what they make off of their investments, right? So they're like a savings account almost, but everyone is recognizing that holding on to the power is not ever going to change what needs to be changed in the community. So for us, as a nonprofit, we're looking at not only building power, sharing power, but then wielding power. And what I mean by wielding power is that we are a voice for those who don't have one, who aren't at the table. So when I say wielding power is taking your position and advocating and be, being a voice um, in the community for what needs to be changed and using all of the data, all of the metrics that you gather to drive your advocacy mission, your advocacy platform forward. Um, so, so that's some of the things that I think are dramatically changing within fundraising and in philanthropy. And it's also ways that you can think about how are you building your own power and then sharing it and then wielding it. So important steps that you could be taking in your own careers. If I could jump in, so, you know, Pam is just not talking. I am a recipient of, of, of what she's talking about, right? And, and, and what that really allows us to do is I could keep pressing the academic tutoring and not have time or space to really go back and look at the social emotional impact that is behind our uh, 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 um, regression or missing the mark in academics, right? And so when uh, a funder is willing to fund you and say, hey, what is the best impact that you can provide? Then you can begin to think out the box and you can begin to say, okay, what, you know, I know that's what we've always done, but what else can we do? And I'm telling you, I didn't, six weeks ago, I had no idea what takes place in the foster care system, right? And how that impacts the numbers in the academic system, right? And how do we uh, meet that? And how do we help uh, in collaboration for the county mental health or, or you know, somebody like a student advocacy center work through these processes? So again, you see, I get fired up now because we're talking real impact on the ground, changing somebody's life. 
right? And so thank you. Uh, I've had I've had funders reach out to me and say, Daryl, do you need? And, 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 you know, I feel a little bad because my predecessor, he never got to experience nothing like that. That's the only way it's been for me. I, my whole career has been in, in, in the pandemic. So it's a little absurd. I know it won't continue exactly like that, but I've been real blessed in the way it's gone. At 10,000 Villages side, this is a major pivot for us because we historically did not have any funders at all. Right? So it was our revenue. Um, it was our only source of really income to support programming, right? Like it's, we would try to keep our costs and overhead as low as possible so we can return as big a portion of sales to the artisans globally. Um, and that's how we create impact. And so this is an area we have to continue evolving. We've started to, but there's a few key things we have to focus on. One is people don't even realize that we are a nonprofit, right? We just look like another retail store on Main Street. And so helping customers to realize that we're a nonprofit organization to understand what our mission is. And the second piece is just getting uh, people comfortable with donating and realizing, right, if we can cover some of these fixed costs or if we can even raise funding for investments in order to sell more product, we're creating more jobs um, for people in disadvantaged communities across the globe. So it's an area we've started to and had minimal success, but we'll need to keep pushing on here in the coming years months um, to expand our donor base as well. If I could just jump in there, I'm wearing a, a necklace from uh, someone overseas, Tim, that was sold to me. And when that story, I had never heard of 10,000 Villages. And when somebody shared to me your model and what you guys do, I was like, you know, it just makes sense to purchase from there when I can, right, to support and help what you guys do. So great, great work. Daryl, you're hired. Chief Chief Marketing Officer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the next the next question that we have, I think, touched on a bit, but if any of the panelists you'd like to go into a little bit deeper is around the persistent needs of the communities that you are serving and interacting with. Um, so perhaps if you could elaborate if you had anything else around what what needs have you know been present all throughout uh, pre and during COVID and how has maybe COVID uh, brought to light these needs in a different way or changed the way that you're interacting with these communities and we will start with Daryl this time you know I can't remember his name and I'm sorry about that but as a professor at U of M and he did a research project on uh, uh, folks in Ypsilanti. And he talked about the vision of how to come out of, not saying that all Ypsilanti is in poverty, but uh, uh, how to come out of that poverty. And he talked about the women saw themselves in the help field and the men saw themselves working for the plant, right? That's what a successful life looked like. And so I bring that up to say, when we talk about what the community needs, sometimes it's the vision of what the other existence looks like, right? If you've never really known a white collar worker, it's hard for you to envision yourself as a white collar worker, right? And so when we look at, you know, I mentioned Catch a Fire, when, when, when these people were mentoring me, they were really just doing their projects, but, 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 but really they were touching me in a way that said, oh, wow, this can be done. It allowed me to dream differently, right? And so when I look at, uh, as we come out of this pandemic, one of the things that we really want to provide with our volunteers and, and community collaboration is that we create a different dream. Right, that we give people a different vision of their future and what their lives can be. The, the, the human body is designed to heal itself given the right circumstances, and that's what we want to be part of. Love that, Daryl. It's amazing. Um, so, on, on our side, the, the main need of the communities we're working is just jobs, right? Um, they need a, a, a sustainable way to support themselves and their families. A little story. So I went and visited, last time I was in Kenya, I stopped by to visit one of our artisan groups that supplies for us. 
And he was telling me a story during the last crisis, this was in 2008, 2009, right? Um, they lost pretty much all their customers that they were selling to. They had 10,000 villages and several others, you know, international partners they would sell products to. Um, they lost all of them except 10,000 villages because no one was buying, right? 10,000 villages continued just to buy and stockpile um, just because we didn't want to burn the relationships with the artisans and we knew that like their lives, livelihoods depended on these sales, right? And so we just filled up warehouses with product until the economy started to bounce back. And because of that, you know, he, he had to let off a lot of staff, but he stayed in business. And since that time has been adding on more and more staff from the slum he grew up in um, over the past several years. We're trying to do that again now as well to support them. You know, we can't buy the same levels previously because we're not selling them, but still, you know, not cutting down as far as we could either, still trying to buy what we can um, because really just having that job is, is the biggest need that they're facing. Um, for us, something that was different and it's a, it's a persistent need, but I don't think we recognized it or saw it because the, the Latin and Hispanic populations in Washtenaw County are so used to not engaging with a system, so a system of healthcare or a system of safety net. And um, United Way runs up a, a hotline called 211. You can uh, access 24 seven, it's a free resource and we'll connect you with the local, the closest local resources for whatever it is you need. And so, uh, about of the 8,000 calls that we get, um, rent and utility prevention shutoff and food were, are usually three of the highest. And so we started to talk to our friends in the Latin and, in, um, in the Latin and Mexican communities. And they're like, well, yes, you know, uh, only one in six uh, people can ha have a job where they don't have to go to work. They're essential workers. So they're on the front lines. They, they have to go be a bus driver, a childcare provider, you know, wh whatever it is. And they're struggling because some of their hours have been cut. They don't access, um, you know, they don't access government services. And so we started partnerships with Buenos Vecinas and Mexicanas in, in Michigan and gave them, um, grants to help and the notes that we got back were amazing because you hear these long just heartbreaking stories about people working so hard right they're working so hard but yet they don't reap any of the benefits of our systems and so um, those were two new partnerships that really for us highlighted how much need goes unseen um, and the need is persistent um, and it's something that we really need to think disruptively about and we need to be very intentional in kind of co-creating these strategies in, in a cross-sector collaboration kind of way to make sure that the people that need our help the most are getting it. And it's not always the easiest way or the easiest path to do that. So your questions are really good tonight. Whoever wrote those questions, get a round of applause. Thank you for being thoughtful. <laughs> uh, and Pam, I think that's actually a, a great point to kind of um, expand on. Um, what I'm hearing is there's been um, a lot of innovation to come from nonprofits and boards during this time. Um, and so I would love uh, for uh, um, you all to answer, what innovations have you seen in the sector or with partner organizations? And are there models that bring hope or inspiration? And so Pam, if we could start with you, Pam, Tim, then Daryl. Um, so one of the things for me that has been really inspirational is how nonprofits, schools, and governments have been coming together um, and really having deep conversations about how to help the education system and recognizing the structures that have prevented children of color from really succeeding and thriving in the system as we know it. And so 
organizations like Daryl's and so many others like CAN and the Y and Big Brothers and Big Sisters are forming partnerships to go deeper into community to really provide the safety net of support for, for children, understanding that we don't get a second chance, right? You're only three, you're only four, you're only seven once. Um, and a lot of us have been talking about what Daryl alluded to earlier is that next year is gonna be a remedial year in education. Like we know it and we need to plan for it now. And gratefully, this pandemic has forced us all to drop out of our silos and really start talking on a much deeper level about not only how we're going to change, but how can we kind of co-create a solution that's gonna work. The 10,000 Villages, I guess the relevant sector for us is really retail, right? Because we're a retail store. And so it's seeing what can we borrow from other retail stores and apply it to our nonprofit context. Um, there's been a lot of innovations in this space past several months. You know, you have Walgreens offering all kinds of products through the pharmacy drive through now. Um, you have Walmart who's trying to set up stores with only um, self-checkout as well. Because basically what we had before, our, our main criteria that we looked at was traffic and conversion, right? How do you get people into the store and make a sale? Well, now that's the exact wrong metric <laughs> because you have a pandemic and so you cannot have too many people in the store, um, both from a public health standpoint and also regulatory, right? It's restricted capacity limitations. And so now it's how do you actually get people out of the store? <laughs> so how do you create like digital shopping experience as a pivot from the in-person ones you have like retailers doing allowing like using augmented reality let people try things on um, from their own homes and things like this for us you know we picked up the curbside delivery and some of these innovations which has been helpful um, but it's it's going to require a lot more innovation in the coming months to um, how do you pivot and be more efficient at what you do right and get just the high dollar customers into the store keep as many people as you can outside the store, but still making sales. Um, so it's quite a challenge and why you've seen a lot of retail go bankrupt the past many months. Um, but for us, you know, it's critically important because we're creating jobs and people, their livelihoods are really depending on us to make sales. And so we'll have to continue trying to adopt and borrowing some of these innovations so that um, our current artisans can keep their jobs, but also, you know, create more opportunities as well. Yeah, I'm super excited about one is like, you know, like Pam was mentioning the remedial aspect of coming out of COVID, right? And being really able, preparing ourselves to address that and moving that. But then it comes back down to the economics, right? You know, what Tim's saying about the stores and, and how this stuff goes. Inside the communities, we need, we need gifted minds who aren't thinking with the old paradigms right? And are thinking like, if anything is possible coming out of uh, uh, COVID, what would we want it to be like? I'm thinking like, you know, our social, and well, when we get out of this thing, are we going to want to get together, right? <laughs> how, so now, how do we, who's ready? You know, some of those stores that may have closed down now could be a certain kind of youth center, could be a certain kind of right. Who's ready to help develop that and build that? Because I'm looking at if we can do our uh, uh, tutoring virtually 30 minutes a day and a kid, now each kid has his, his own tutor, right? Now, Friday, we want to just get together in a social setting. We want to come together and, and, and be able to hug each other and move and go places and do this. So again, being able to uh, rethink, right? Not being stuck with what we've already done and how it always was, because we don't have to do that anymore. And I know that the uh, the collaborations, again, for me, we're working with, you know, in Ginsburg, we're working with CTAC to look at our evaluation metrics, right? And how do we really report to Pam and them and show them what we've done, right? And so I say that to say, the brilliant minds, you guys getting on those boards and allowing folks to think differently and achieve those outcomes is what's gonna make a difference. Well, that was the 
perfect segue into the final question that Jatem and I have before we're going to open it up to the rest of the group to ask questions. But we would just love to know, I guess, kind of on this topic of hope and change, um, and also just this conversation we're having tonight, there's a lot of discussion happening. But what has been your all's experience of the greater conversation in the nonprofit communities about the impact of COVID and also just looking forward about, you know, how to collaborate, how to make changes and how to, I guess, remember what happened during COVID. So this doesn't just become history that repeats itself again when another crisis occurs. So I guess, how do you remember this and how, how have you seen nonprofits engaging in this kind of discussion outside of the boardroom? And for this yep. one, I know Pam may be leaving in a minute or two. Pam, if you wanted to um, provide a last comment, um, we'll let you, you know, make sure you share that before you need to leave. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I put my email in the chat. So if anybody wants to drop me a line um, and I um, wanna say thank you, everybody that has served on a board fellow. As a board fellow, you're making a tremendous difference for the nonprofit. Um, it may not seem like that all the time, but every nonprofit succeeds based on volunteers. We simply don't have the salary um, budget line items to, to make it without volunteers. So know that every minute, every hour, um, any expertise that you lend is, is well worth your own effort and it is certainly benefiting, uh, being a benefit to the community. So I'll say that and uh, sign off. Uh, it was great to be here. Uh, Jatem, thank you again for your leadership. I so appreciate everything. So I'll see you guys soon. Thanks, Pam. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Pam. And then Tim and Daryl, feel free to chime in. Yeah, I uh, can jump in here. I think one kind of emerging uh, trend and engagement on this is exploring public-private nonprofit partnerships. Traditionally, these three spheres kind of operate in their own spaces. Right? But a great example of this is Detroit Means Business. You can look up DetroitMeansBusiness.org, which is a resource stood up to support small businesses through the pandemic. And this is a partnership between you know, the city of Detroit, state of Michigan, uh, the major uh, large companies, in the city, also the nonprofit philanthropic sectors um, coming together just to see what can we do to support the small business community um, and prevent you know, a lot of major bankruptcies and loss of jobs um, in the city of Detroit. And so it's these are sectors that haven't worked together historically really at all, right? Um, coming together in the same room to see what we can do because you know, the nonprofit philanthropic sector previously they're doing a lot of great work in supporting, but with the pandemic. You know, the scale of the need has just been exacerbated, um, you know, like through the roof, right? And so that it's not enough that can be done on their own. And so you really need to look at engaging across all three sectors in order to address some of the core issues, I think. And um, that's one example. And there are examples in other cities as well where that's starting to happen, which is really exciting. Yeah, I get excited about just the... Um of a more community approach that's being taken. I come from a background that says, if the community is tight, it can kind of do anything, right? And it can take care of itself. And I think that sometimes we had let our system run so bad, people didn't have time for community. They didn't have time to kind of look out for one another. And I think what we found through this situation was that we needed each other, right? And that uh, the more we kind of get together and, and put some of the other things, you know, if you made one less dollar, you'll be all right, right? And, and, and that those few minutes that you got to spend with somebody might be more valuable than the dollar that you was chasing, right? And so I think in that we can, uh, uh, create a different world. I would tell you a story, but it's a little bit longer than I could tell. So you have to look me up and remind me to tell you the story about the fisherman. <laughs> I will remember that, Daryl. <laughs> All right, well, I think Jatem's gonna lead us in the open Q&A um, from the audience. 
Um, I want to thank the panelists uh, one more time uh, for taking the time out to speak to us. You all provided us um, some major gems tonight uh, for understanding what's happening in the nonprofit world and what's possibly to come. I just wanted to remind everyone it's now time for questions. Um, you can raise hands uh, and unmute yourself once called on, or you can send questions in the catch. Um, I did see in the chat that there was already a question in reference to um, Catch Fire, and I think Daryl, you may have brought this up. Could someone speak to how Catch Fire was used specifically? What type of projects work well on the platform? Well, I can tell you for us, uh, you know, we were struggling with our CRM, and I don't know how I uh, came across Salesforce. And so Salesforce says, hey, Daryl, we'll grant you Salesforce. Now that's a $22,000 grant. We'll give you that. She said, but the trick is customizing it is going to cost you $22,000. So if you ain't got $22,000 to customize it, don't take it. I said, well, I did see that there was a catch a fire project for Salesforce customization. So I offered a project up. This guy who wants to get into Salesforce, whose wife already works for Salesforce, takes the project. He opens up our Salesforce, gets it going. That's about a $22,000 deal. I come back and I post another project. A lady comes on and she develops the program app for me. Another $22,000 gift. The third guy comes in and he does our volunteer program, gets it all fixed up in Salesforce. Then he comes back and does a second one. So in all in all, we've done about a hundred thousand dollar investment into Salesforce that now becomes our CRM for donors, constituents, uh, uh, all the data that we're you know we're going to try to capture. We didn't even know we could do that. And that's what we come out of the pandemic with. So that's the way Catch a Fire can be utilized for different people offering different projects and services for you. Much like you guys do it in, in, in U of M's Ginsburg. Um, and there was another question in chat, um, and this may be more of a Daryl question again, um, but we learned a lot tonight around um, the needs for kids and parents that were probably pre-existing um, and have been exacerbated um, due to COVID. Um, so, um, and Tim, please chime in if you also have seen any experience with this as well. Um, could you elaborate on the collaboration um, that is needed and that you've seen to support kids and parents during the pandemic? Yeah, it's, you know, it's amazing what a parent could need to make their lives better. And it's not always just money. That's why I go back to that community uh, uh, piece. So it's funny. So like, okay, so Catch a Fire mentors me. I hire a kid who now is going to get about $3,200, right, that goes and helps and he just buys his own clothes which takes that out of the parent's budget, right? And then that parent is able to maybe afford a better internet service, right? And now all of a sudden, these kids can lock in and grow at a level like never seen before. So part of it just comes with, again, us having conversations. I think too often we were just so busy. We was running so fast we never stopped to really ask the people who were who we were trying to serve, what do you need, right? What do you want? And, and you'd be amazed at, at, at the people who want to put their lives together and get out of poverty. And maybe they've had third generation of poverty and, and they're looking for a way out. And sometimes it's just being with somebody else who knows that way, right? Who really lives that way so they can hold on to and go. So that's what we do within that collaboration is just match people up, give people the opportunity to know other people and see different ways of living. I hope that answered the question. 
Thank you. Um, and those were all the questions we had so far in the chat box. So um, please raise your hand if you have anything else to ask Daryl or Tim. While we wait, Tim, I'll ask you a question. question. Um, Darryl, Actually, oh, great. And my internet just froze. So, so All right, um, we're gonna let whoever that was come back on soon, but we'll call on Nicole in the meantime. Hello, everyone. This is incredible. I, I'm so glad I am. If you're wondering why I'm in a car with this light on, it's because I'm at work. But I had to come on here. Um, I'm the board of directors president for Cody Rouge Community Action Alliance in Detroit. And I wanted to ask Tim, with the issue of funding right now with um, such a great store uh, option, I didn't know you guys even existed. Um, do you have a donate button or anything on your website to be able to contribute to any type of fundraisers or anything? Yeah, um, that's a great question. We, I can send you a link to, um, to donate. So we, we have campaigns, fundraising campaigns from time to time, um, but I have a link that I could send out. So yeah, thank you for your interest. Really appreciate that. Thank you. All right, Emily, you're good to go. Yeah, my internet cut out just as I was about to ask the question. But um, so I guess I'm curious, um, and this is kind of both personally and professionally as leaders at these organizations and as part of the board, um, who you've kind of gone to for your own mentorship or for your own kind of learning um, as you've tried to navigate some of these challenges. Yeah, for me, you know, I was just in, uh, I came through the Leaders of Color uh, with New and United Way sponsored, and I, I I got four board members out of Leaders of Color and put them on my board, right? So, and, 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 and it's just amazing, again, to just go to them and watch them work, right? You know, they say things to me that really, you know, I can't, my mind can't really even hold, right? Now, they'll, 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 and then they'll be like, but then they'll walk me through it, right? And they'll keep me going and I'll be like, whoa. And, 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 and it's just amazing to keep coming up to a space and have this newness, right? And I think that sometimes we can get, we can get stale, right? And our minds quit expanding. Like I was just thinking about for Tim, maybe instead of, you know, you, he sells what he sells in the store, but like Nicole was just saying, he got to start selling the store, right? The best kept secret, 10,000 villages, man. Hey man, I'm going to shop there from now on. I'd heard of it, but I, I really wasn't, you know, but when he came on and now it's like, okay, that's a whole different avenue now. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, definitely very supportive of that. Uh, on, on my side and the mentorship, um, I've been involved in the Detroit Means Business um, Coalition, which I mentioned earlier. So I think that's been a great way um, to share ideas and learn from other partners. Also, I think what's been helpful is just through my you know, full-time professional work and, and mentors at work. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of work supporting companies and governments through the pandemic. And so we published a lot of articles um, through there as well, which has um, provided a lot of inspiration um, for me that I can bring to the board also. And I should have just added one more. I'm going to tell you as, as, as a black man, my uh, connection in WMBK is amazing, right? Because there are so many professional brothers there. And, and, and seeing people that look like you does make a difference, right? I can learn from anybody. But seeing somebody that looks like me that shoots the joke a little bit differently, right? You know, uh, 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 we got a guy that's Ohio State basketball star on our board. And, and the jokes just flow differently, right? And so 
that, that has really been a great resource for me and them brothers really lead me and guide me too. Thanks so much. Yeah, both of you for those resources too. I think they're helpful for people outside of this call as well, just to think about our own development and pushing ourselves and the communities we surround ourselves with. Hi, right, and Nicole, you can um, bring yourself off mute and ask your question. It's kind of a two part for both Tim and Daryl. Um, one is do either of you have you or will you be considering a fund development team? to help you financially? <laughs> so I keep selling catch a fire. So this lady, Copar, No Par Consulting, just finished our fundraising development plan. And then a catch a fire that I had a year ago took this position with Impact Consulting. And he reached out to me about three months ago and he established a team, this international team, right? that is going to do our development and another international team that's doing our marketing. So I am super excited. I'm a little, I'm a little like, I didn't really know that you guys had this at U of M. <laughs> so I feel bad like going out of state when I got the Michigan difference right here, right? And so learning how to collaborate like that is really the key for me because this is not my profession. This is not what I was raised to do, right? So getting outside knowledge is, is what makes it work for me. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think Nicole, your question was on if we're going to develop a fund development team. Was that the question? If you yeah. have okay. considered hiring one or if you have yeah. one that you're working with already. Yeah. Um, so we have a board member um, who's uh, the chair of development. Actually, that due to all the pressures and stress of COVID, um, the board member had to step down. So we're actually recruiting for a new board member to kind of head that up. But we have started having some conversations on, is it worth a full-time role or outsourcing in some way? Um, so it is a, a conversation we started, but um, have not finalized. Okay. Because we have, a, um, was it speaking to it being a full-time position or not, we actually contracted our fund development uh, team. And I was just gonna offer that as a suggestion to, they don't have to be a full-time staff, but they could be a contracted account that you could also get funding for to pay for them being a contractor. And the other part of my, I don't know if it was a question, maybe a statement, Tim, you brought up corporations and nonprofits coming together and it is definitely beneficial. It is happening in Michigan because it's happened with us. We partnered, um, I've been board president now six years. We had partnerships with GM, DTE, and Quicken Loans. And it's been very beneficial to our community um, and with the whole pandemic happening and Quicken and a couple of other people, Comcast, and working with us and getting um, rocket fiber internet to our residents who needed it for homeschooling and things like that. So it is definitely happening. It is something you both should dig around a little bit and look into and find those partnerships. Our contact at GM switched from one person to another. She took on another role in another position, but it's definitely out there and it is happening and it is effective and they are doing long-term partnerships. We had a partnership for five years when we started off the rip. So it wasn't like one year we started and then we'd see if it would work. It was a start of five years. So it's definitely out here. The partnerships are effective. Incredible. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, this is so great information sharing. Um, now we'll turn it over to Ashore. You can bring yourself off of mute. Hey, uh, firstly, thanks so much. I uh, really appreciated you, um, your time tonight. Um, my question uh, as for Tim, as a relatively recent Michigan grad, I'd love to hear some you know, what sort of experiences, whether that be classes or in your clubs or outside or in any way, really do you think were best prepared you for um, your role in, in, at, at the nonprofit? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think, it, to be honest, a lot of the business strategy um, courses at Ross were incredibly beneficial. Now that I'm chair of strategic planning, um, take any course with, um, 
Now I'm forgetting the name now, but he teaches business and society, teaches strategies for growth. Um, you all probably know who he is, but I um, learned a ton from him as well. I think just the, the bigger point too is just get involved as, as much as you can. Um, I just joined everything in my time at Ross. I didn't get any sleep, but it was well worth it. You know, if you're interested in startups, go to Zellery Institute, it's a great time, risk-free way to try out literally anything. Um, so I was heavily engaged in business plus impact and Zellery, um, a lot of other areas. So this is like perfect time um, to try out any of your passions. And so I would just say, go, go and do it. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I could just add on there, Carolyn Nopal was the lady that did our fund development piece. And I mean, this 18 page report, uh, all the supporting documents, right? I mean, this was invaluable to a small organization like us. My mother used to say that she didn't, she didn't have no high school education or nothing, but she used to always say, you know, if com com sense is not common. Right. And so you think that what you know, everybody else knows, but that ain't true. Right. And there's an organization that needs what you have and can really just turn them around and be phenomenal for them. So like Tim was saying, man, get just get out there, guys, and, and, and let your light shine. Uh, thank you so much for um, that was a great question. I definitely was wondering, you know, what are some words for us as board fellows who do have this interest in the nonprofit realm, social service, and wanting to support them? Um, how can we get more involved? So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, we do have about 11 more minutes, so there's definitely time for more questions if there are any in the audience. So don't be shy, raise your hand or put it in the chat box. Just from that last question, I would add as well, there are a number of other opportunities um, at Ross. There's a community consulting club um, that allows you to contribute to nonprofits. Um, there's Emerging Markets Club that does consulting projects as well. Um, Detroit Meets Business, or sorry, um, Detroit Vitalization, I think it was called, initiative. Um, there's a number of these clubs at Ross that offer other opportunities to volunteer and plug into nonprofits too. So definitely check those out. And Tim, I'll just, I'll go ahead, Haley. I, I can send an email to everyone that registered for this event with all of the resources that we've been discussing and links to the resources around the area and um, at U of M so that you can have that full list of everything that's been shared with each other tonight. And I guess just to like, kind of follow up on that sense of um, the process of being a board member, um, Daryl and Tim, because Daryl, I know you started um, as a board member and you took on this role as volunteer. Uh, what does that work look like to get involved on a board? Um, many of us will probably be moving to um, outside of Michigan, moving to different cities. Um, and so what do you think is necessary for us to get involved in a nonprofit world and possibly be a board member uh, within a few years to continue supporting uh, the missions like we're doing now as fellows? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I, I was fortunate, you know, through the nonprofit board fellowship at Ross to then be offered a full-time position later after I started working full time. Um, so that was an incredible opportunity to get plugged in since I was staying in the area, um, it worked out well. But I would say outside of that, I think a great way is just find an area that you're passionate about and reach out. Just send an email, you can start by even volunteering um, you know, with the nonprofit in your, your spare time and then start to have conversations and explore, you know, do you have needs for any board members? So um, I've had a few other opportunities come up from places I volunteered at as well. I didn't have the time capacity to take on at the moment, but um, we'll explore in the future. So I think, you know, finding what you're passionate about and, and just starting by volunteering is a great way to get plugged in and explore opportunities. Yeah, I think that's a great, great advice, Tim. Just the volunteering, kind of seeing what the organizations do and then just kind of marching your way up. I know for me, you know, I had tried to uh, do a nonprofit myself and failed miserably. And uh, a friend of mine came to me and said, man, you ought to, he'd always tease me. He said, man, you're always down in the basement working on something. You ought to come out that basement and meet Emmanuel. 
And so I came out and I met Emmanuel and instantly I fell in love with Emmanuel and what he was trying to do. And I thought, well, man, you done learned all this stuff about being on a board or creating a board. Why don't you just sit on his board? And I did. And uh, Emmanuel started it, you know, when he was a senior in uh, college. And so, you know, at 30 years old, the money's kind of hard to keep flowing. He wanted to move on. And I was in a position that I really didn't need a check right now, right? So it was a, it was a perfect fit for us to transition the organization. So like Tim say, just get in there, find your passion. I mean, this is my passion. And I can't believe that I get to wake up and do this, right? I, I mean, if you would have told me this is where I would be, you know, kind of in my last part of my, my years in life, Man, I'd have told you, you, you know, it can't be. So get out there, find your passion, and just give it a shot. You'll, you'll make it work. If there are no questions in the chat, I will just ask one final question, which is essentially parting words um, for us, but board fellows and um, many of us interested in the nonprofit sector. Um, based off your learnings from COVID, uh, what advice do you have for us entering the space in 2021, 2022, and beyond um, to make sure that we are um, meeting the needs of organizations, the communities we serve? How most, how best to be impactful? I'll let Tim go last so you can have the brilliant stuff at the end. So uh, the, uh, the thing that I always say, man, just show up with your full self right? Really just unleash you. There's a, the, there's a spot that only you can feel, right? That nobody else can do what you do. And if you bring that to an organization, an organization is going to be blessed. You can spend a lot of time just kind of figuring your way out on the board and what to do. Man, jump in there, right? And, and get with somebody and just bring your passion and bring your uh, knowledge and your expertise and somebody's sitting there hungry for it. I know Mentor to Youth is, if any of you need a place to show up, look me up. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think to me, the biggest thing to keep in mind is, is just empathy, right? So if, if you think about plug in a nonprofit, you know, where you have awesome missions to support people, think about like the staff there as well that might be struggling, right? So we, we were focused, how can we increase sales, you know, for artisans, but realizing a lot of our volunteers at the store, our full-time staff there um, are significantly impacted as well. Um, and so just keep that in mind moving forward to check up on people, um, see how they're doing, right? And see how you can support them as well and not get too focused on, you know, this one mission. Thank you so much. You all have given us um, so many things to ponder on and think about um, in the midst of COVID and beyond. Thank you again. And now I'll turn things over to Haley. Thank you, Jatim. How do I say your name, Jatim? Jatim. Jatim. Thank you, Jatim. And a warm thank you from me as well. You both have been wonderful and Pam um, as well, just as our panelists. And I can already see the resources being shared after this session. So Hope everyone can keep that hope and optimism going forward. Great, right. and I'll just add on to the thank yous tonight. Thank you again to our panelists. We know you're um, busy doing a lot of important work in our community. So we really appreciate you spending time with us this evening to share resources, to share learnings, um, and to, to just have a, a dialogue with our community. Um, also, thank you to our senior fellows for being wonderful moderators, for having uh, really great questions that uh, you know, had some thought provoking answers. Um, I think it was just a great evening. So again, thank you all. I will send a follow up email to all of those who registered with all of the resources that were um, shared in the chat. So I will be hanging out for a few minutes if anyone has any um, questions for me or about the board fellowship program. But again, thank you all for coming. Thank you guys, everybody take care. Yeah, thank you all for organizing and attending. This was great. Thanks, y'all. Good to see you, Tim. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.